Okay, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Get pumped. No, I'm just kidding. I, that's not me. I'm sorry. Um, uh, just a few announcements. I want to start off with a few announcements uh, before I forget. So my name is Daniel. Uh, welcome to Chinese Church in Christ South Valley. Uh, it's good to see all of you and welcome all you Zoom people. Um, we are having an all-church retreat October 7th through the 9th. And today is the last day to sign up. Uh, if you don't sign up today, you will be shut out of the gates and you won't be able to enter in anymore. Um, so it, it'll, be at, it'll be at Mission Springs, which is a really fun campsite. Uh, I love this place because there's a basketball court and I just probably will be spending all my time playing basketball. If any of you want to play basketball with me, I would love it. Uh, if no one does, then I'll just play by myself and be sad. But it's really fun. Uh, you should sign up or have your parents sign up. And uh, for the English side, my dad will be speaking on Saturday. Uh, so Fred Gillum, uh, he is my dad, and uh, I'm really excited to hear what he's going to say. So I'd encourage you to sign up. There are already many of you who have signed up. It'll be really fun. Okay, uh, second announcement. Uh, Dan is on sabbatical. So as of Friday night, he like left youth group and then he got on like a red eye flight to like New Jersey or something and then got on a long subway trip from New Jersey to New York where his, uh, actually it might be Brooklyn, I don't know, where his brother lives and his family is uh, spending time. So for the next two months, uh, he will be gone, which means if you have any questions or need help with anything, please contact me or Ken, our English elder. Uh, don't contact Dan, leave him alone, please. Uh, I know he would appreciate just having some uh, time and space away where he can enjoy his family, uh, spend time with God, uh, go visit, go golf. He's going to spend like probably a, the vast majority of his time golfing. Uh, so he'll be coming back in the middle of October, or sorry, middle of November. Uh, and so until then, uh, we are going to be going through a series of parables. And then we'll have a few guest speakers sprinkled in. So just letting you know, giving you a heads up, OK? Uh, so let me go ahead and get started. Let me start by reading our passage. This is Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, um, and then 36 through 43. So if you have a Bible or a phone, uh, go ahead and turn with us to Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 13, 24 through 30 and then 36 through 43, okay? This is one of Jesus' parables. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the master of the house came and said, or sorry, when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And this is verse 36 through 43. Um, he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows is the, the good seed, is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, I pray 
that you would help us understand and illuminate this parable uh, so you would apply it um, and we would be receptive to it um, to our, uh, so that our hearts would be transformed. Um, I pray especially for people who are going through um, terrible difficulties right now that you would be consoling them and giving them hope. Uh, you would help, help us all understand the reality of the world we live in, um, your future judgment, and your incredible patience for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, we did the meta parable, which is the parable of the soils. Uh, and a parable is, this is my slipshod definition, it's not perfect. It's a word picture or a story that communicates some kind of non-literal or you could say spiritual truth that has force on its audience, okay? So this is a story or a picture that has a point. And when Jesus tells these parables, he's actually being a very engaging, interesting speaker, and he's packing so much uh, truth and depth into very short uh, little pictures or stories. And so when we're reading parables, the first parable, the parable of the soils, is a meta parable, which means this parable tells us how to understand parables. So the, uh, the main takeaway from the parable of the soils, uh, at the end, Jesus says basically, the good soil, the people who are receptive to the word of God, are the people who hold it fast in a good and honest heart and bear fruit with patience. Okay, so the people who hold fast, who are good soil, are people who can respond to God's word and they keep it with them. And so I actually didn't spend a lot of time applying how you might, or uh, preaching on how you might apply the end of that parable, because I was talking more about the different soils uh, and how, I mean, I'm actually kind of curious, do you guys remember what the four soils are? This is from not last week, but two weeks ago. Whoa, two weeks ago, right? That's a long time. Um, does anyone remember? You don't have to say what they are. Just raise your hand if you think you kind of remember what they are. Okay, good job. Yeah, a few of you. Okay, awesome. I like to hear that. So the important thing that I would say, uh, one big takeaway that Jesus has coming out of the parable of the soils is he says to the people, take care how you listen. He's saying from the parable of the soils, it's very easy to receive the word of God. And you might even, so there are some of you who just in one ear out the other. You know, that's one of the soils. There are some of you who initially receive it very positively, but you have no depth or no root. And so when hard times come, when testing comes, when the sun starts beating down on this plant, the roots aren't deep enough to get to the water. And so when the sun comes, when you're in San Jose and the temperature is 109 degrees, the sun comes and withers the plant. The third soil are the people whose hearts are divided, where, you know, some of you might respond positively to the word of God, but then, you know, if you're like me, you have a kid, um, or you get married, or you're, you go to college, or just the normal life of like a high schooler or middle schooler in Silicon Valley is totally insane, um, and there are so many different things that occupy our attention, and so our attention and our hearts are divided, and the picture there is there are thorns that choke the growth of the word of God. And so one of the other parallel passages that we didn't talk about says the thorns are the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. And so if you pay attention to the state of your heart, you will realize sometimes the cares of life um, overwhelm your attention and your ability to receive God. Um, and you, you, you kind of like stray off the path. What I mean by that is um, because you're so stressed out, um, you want to exert control over your circumstances and you think your life would be better if you could just change your circumstances and as a result of that, you ignore God. The other one is the deceitfulness of riches. We live in Silicon Valley and I would say Silicon Valley is a place that is characterized by the worship of money, okay? by the worship of money. So if you think about, uh, like I went with my wife to LinkedIn 
uh, a few through, like we took Enoch oh, not too long ago. And LinkedIn is a utopia. It's a techtopia where this company is so incredibly rich and successful and each of the people walking in that campus, if they work there, is tremendously rich or at least the people who are the tech workers are because all of the people who make the perks and the amenities happen are like the restaurant workers, the janitors, and those people don't get treated really well, but the tech people do. And just the amount of food they have, free food, free drinks, sparkling water, all you can drink, it's amazing. Um, but the thing is, all of Silicon Valley becomes concentrated around getting there, getting through the door, getting into the tech company, making it to Google or Facebook or whatever it might be. And I'm not saying work is bad, I'm just saying riches are deceitful because many people think if I just had enough money, I would be happy. But the really interesting thing is um, there are all types, I could use a lot of examples about this. There's um, the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. Uh, I don't know if you guys follow that. The idea is work really, really hard and save 50% of your take home pay. And after roughly 10 to 15 years of that hard work, unless you're, you have like some kind of windfall, uh, you can quit your job and just live on the income that comes from your stocks, or you can sell a percentage of your stocks each year, withdraw it, and you can do that forever. You could live the rest of your life on this nest egg that you built. But what's really interesting is if you look at the, the subreddits that talk about financial independence, retire early, one of the problems that many people have when they start this journey, um, it, w when you're working, you're like, work sucks, school sucks. If I finally could stop working, I would be free, I would be happy, I could travel the world, everything would be perfect. You know, I would read lots of books, I would sit on the beach, it would be so amazing, right? But when you actually read the subreddit, you know what a lot of them say? They, they retire early, and then they're like, wait a second, I don't have any meaning in my life anymore. Or you spent so much time working that you didn't develop relationships or friendships in your lives, and so many of the people who have tons of money, who have more money than they know what to do with, are alone. They don't have anyone. Or they, have, they fight with their spouse, and then they get divorced, and then they lose a lot of their money, and their dreams, go, their, their dreams disappear. The deceitfulness of riches. No matter how much money you have, that will not make you happy. And it actually becomes a weed that chokes the word of God and makes you unreceptive to what God's word says. And then the final soil is uh, the desire for other things. And so that could just be your desire for anything other than God. And so the picture of the soil is take care how you listen, pay attention to how you hear, and then keep the word of God in your heart. So uh, what this means is, and this is the one takeaway I would have you uh, learn, is um, I recommend that you memorize very small sections of the Bible. Um, find a verse that you really love and is really helpful for you um, and just meditate on it. And every day, I'm, you don't even have to read a big chunk of the Bible. Just read one verse, the same verse, every day for a week. Try to memorize it. And the incredible thing about this is this is how you experience your day-to-day -day relationship with God um, outside of Sunday, outside of Friday, whatever it might be. Um, you take God's word with you in your heart and so you're in the middle of a test or you're at school or you're at work and the word of God comes to your mind and God speaks to you and you remember his presence with you and this is how you experience your relationship with God. And not only this, the, to memorize the word of God actually transforms you and gives you power to avoid sin. That's what Psalm 119 says where the psalmist says, I've stored up your word in my heart lest I sin against you or that I would not sin against you. Um, so if you're, okay, so all of that is like summarizing what we talked about last time. I need to get into what we're talking about this time. <laughs> um, let me put myself in the shoes of a person who's relatively new to church or someone who doesn't, who um, might have questions about God. Let me articulate to you two profound questions that I think we've, been, we've all been dealing with in the last few years. Uh, and the reason I do this is because I really feel for people who are skeptical. The, the first thing I said, which is basically, it's so important to receive the word of God. Um, it's so good to listen to God and obey him and trust him. What I didn't say is, okay, Daniel, you're saying that the word of God is good, but Daniel, I don't know if God is good. 
You get me? I don't know if God is trustworthy, and so therefore, why should I obey the word of God? Why should I memorize the word of God? Why should I receive the word of God? If you've grown up in church, it's very possible that your pastors, your youth counselors, your parents have never actually addressed or dealt with the kind of nagging questions and doubts that many of you have. And what I want to say is these are extremely important. These are intellectually credible arguments against the goodness and existence of God, and they need to be taken seriously if people are going to actually have um, faith in God and real trust. Because if you don't trust the person of God, why would you read his word? And then when it comes to the really hard situations where you are at a fork in the road and you have two choices, do I trust the word of God when it's risky and feels dangerous or do I not? What what really you're going to have to lean on when you're making that choice is, do I believe that God is good? Do I believe he actually wants good for me when he tells me what to do or when he guides me with his truth? Um, So let me express these two profound questions. I don't know, I honestly, again, these are big questions, so I'm not even going to try, I'm not even, I'm not even saying that we're going to be able to cover them comprehensively, but I just want to share them because they're important, and I want to look at this parable as a way of actually addressing them to some degree. Um, The first question, if God loves us, why is the world full of evil, suffering, and tragedy? Why doesn't God stop these bad things from happening? This is actually a really great question. Uh, When you go through life and Christians say to you, or pastors say to you, God loves you. One of the the first thing that happened if you've had a difficult life is, okay, then why didn't God restrain the evil people in my life or the evil circumstances that have traumatized me or hurt me? Why didn't God restrain those evils? Why didn't God save me out of the suffering that I've been going through. And so when we think about the tragedies our church has undergone in the last couple of years, when we think about the pandemic, um, do you know what day today is? It's 9-11. And when you think about incredibly terrible circumstances like the, the Twin Towers terrorist attack, or you just read the news, or you just think about your life, you think about how lonely you are, how, like, how difficult your mental state is, Um, with all the pressures of school, um, when your friends backstab you, um, things are not working out in the romantic department, whatever it might be. There's so many difficult things in our lives that we deal with. And so when pastors say to you, God loves you, and then they stop there, you're like, okay, what you're saying is an abstract truth to me, but my suffering is concrete. Do you know what I mean? My, the love of God feels completely unreal, it's abstract, it's a proposition, it's a truth, and you might even say, okay, sure, God loves me, but I don't feel it, and the suffering and difficulty and evil that I've experienced in my life, I've experienced it, it's real, I've paid the concept, I, I've felt it, and so this is actually a really profound question, and if, if the reason that you don't believe in God or don't trust uh, God's word has to do with this question, then I actually think... I have a lot of respect for you. I think that's a, great, that's a great argument against the existence of God. And this is one of the philosophical arguments that's gone back for a really long time. Problem of evil. Uh, the second question, how could a loving God send people to hell? Both of these questions are philosophical. There's the logical problem of evil where, okay, whatever, you guys don't care. Um, they're philosophical, but they're also personal right? Why would God let this happen in my life? Or how could God send people to hell? If God is loving, how could he possibly do that? Um, The the answer to these questions, what I would say is I'm not going to give a definitive, complete, comprehensive, uh, shut and dry answer. But what what I do want you to see is in this parable, Jesus actually addresses the nature of reality And underneath these questions are assumptions about reality that Jesus contradicts or Jesus works against, okay, in this parable. So we're going to see what these are. Um, So we're going to, this parable is a big picture parable. Uh, Not all parables are like this. Many parables have one point, one main point. But this parable, in this parable, Jesus tells a story about the nature of reality in the world. 
And what he says about the nature of reality and the world and the universe is he, he gives, he, he says at least one thing to start off. He says the world is a war zone, okay? And you're like, Daniel, what the heck? What does that mean? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a junior high kid. You know, like, what, what kind of, and you know what? Junior high is a war zone, isn't it? But I'm, what I'm saying is behind the nature of reality, uh, God is not the only party who is at work in this world. In fact, when Jesus is telling this parable, he says that there are two different kingdoms in this world that are at war with each other. And so when you're asking the problem of evil, it's a great question, and you're asking God, okay, why would you allow this evil and suffering in in the world? You're not coming to grips with what Jesus says is the nature of reality, that the world is a war zone. And as we go through the parable, we'll explain what that means. The second thing I want you to see is in this parable, it talks about the final judgment. So as, as I was reading this, um, you know, it's been really, really hot um, the last few days. And as I was preparing this sermon, even in this room right now, the temperature rises as we come to parables like this and doctrines like this, the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of the final judgment. If you notice in the parable, uh, Jesus says he will take the causes of sin and lawbreakers and throw them into a fiery furnace. And when you come to this parable, it's impossible not to think, number one, how could a loving God do that? Number two, am I going into the furnace? And so I remember reading this parable and being afraid. I remember being afraid that I would be a weed, that I would be someone that God throws into uh, the fiery furnace. And so I just want to know, I, I just want you to know, like, I'm aware of how this parable can feel. Um, and, but what I'm trying to actually make an apologetic argument saying that this parable is actually both good news and bad news for us. And particularly, final judgment is both our hope and our despair. Okay? Final judgment is our hope and our despair. So we'll talk about that uh, later. And then finally, our only hope is Christ's patient judgment. So we're going to talk about God's patience. Uh, The world is a war zone. Um, I went to school in Memphis, Tennessee at a small liberal arts school. And I had friends at a church called Second Presbyterian Church in Memphis. Um, Over the last week or so, there was a kindergarten teacher named Eliza Fletcher who was running in the morning when a van pulled up, kidnapped her, and then three days later, her dead body was discovered at a condo. And she went to Second Presbyterian Church, the place where some of my friends went to. And so she's been in the news. And like what I'm saying here is the world is a war zone. You think about 9-11. Uh, I remember when I was in, uh, I was either in sixth grade or seventh grade, I, I could probably figure it out if I thought a little bit more about it. But I remember the, the day when it happened. I was just barely old enough, and I didn't really understand what was happening. But of, all of a sudden, all the adults in the school started acting weird, and the day was completely interrupted. And some of the teachers pulled out like a television and started showing the footage of the, of the terrorist attack. Um, and thousands of people died. Thousands of people died. Fathers, mothers, children died. All in one hor- horrific moment, right? The world is a war zone. Think about your life. Whatever's going on with you, suffering, difficulty, depression, trauma, the world is a war zone. That's what Jesus is saying here, isn't he? Because look at the parable. Let me explain to you the parable. There was a farmer who went to sow seed And then when he he sowed the good seed and went to sleep. At night, an enemy came in and sowed weeds. Okay? So when they woke up the next day, the master and the servants, the servants saw all of these weeds growing up with the wheat. Okay? Let me tell you what these weeds were. There's a type of weed. uh, Jesus' people, the people hearing Jesus' parable, would have known that there is a very specific type of weed called Darnell or Zizania, um, the Greek, anyway, uh, this type of weed looks exactly like wheat until the very, very end of its life when they f- fully mature and grow grain, okay? So the wheat 
would have ha- you guys have seen like stalks of wheat, right? You make wheat bread, whatever. So the the weed the the weed, the wheat has grains. Yeah, I, I, I saw you laughing about that. You you know what I mean? Okay, the wheat has grains that are brown or golden. Zazania or the weed has small black grains. Okay, but you can only differentiate between the two when they've grown all the way up. Now, what's the problem with these weeds? The weeds steal the nutrients, they steal the water, they steal the space, and they're useless. You can't make bread out of them. So if you're a farmer and you're sowing these weeds, the, oh my God, like it's so hard not to say weeds, like weeds and wheat, like it's really hard. So I'm trying to keep it straight. Uh, it's so devastating for the wheat farmers when they can't grow wheat and they grow these weeds instead. And so in this parable, you can imagine what it's like for the, the, the farmer to see his entire field is run through with these weeds. Do you know what's happening? He just lost half of his money. Do you know what's happening? I don't know if his family's going to be able to eat. There's tension here. And what Jesus is saying is the reason that the, the, the servants, and this is where I get the problem of evil and the problem of judgment, The servants go up to the master and they say this, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? Right? And when I was reading this, what's really interesting is in Jesus' explanation of this parable, he doesn't actually address their question. It's really, really interesting. He doesn't directly say that these are who the, the servants are. He doesn't address the answer to the question explicitly. And so as I was reflecting on this parable, what's so interesting is what is the, at the root of their question? At the root of their question could potentially be this, um, this complaint or this kind of confusion or perplexity where they say, I thought you were a good farmer. I thought you knew what you were doing and I worked for you. So I saw that you did good stuff and you farmed well and effectively in the past. So then why all of a sudden are all these weeds everywhere? Like what's going on? And what I think this question actually addresses is this deep question within our hearts, which is, if God is good and God made the world good, why are there weeds? Why is there suffering? Why is there death? Why is there disease? Why is there sin? Why is there trauma? Why is there depression, anxiety, all of these different things? Why did Eliza Fletcher go running in the morning three days later? I mean, she had kids. She had a, she had a husband. She was a great kindergarten teacher. Her students loved her. Why? And so we ask God, why are there there these weeds? If you say your creation is good, if you say you're good, if you're all-powerful and all-knowing and all-loving, why did you mess up in making the world? Uh, The more I read, so I'm so old. I'm so old, and the way that I try to understand um, the kind of state of the world. One of the reason, the one of the ways is actually I read Reddit. I read Reddit, different Reddit posts. I'm serious. So if you look at the general posts that go to the top that get the most likes and the most points in Reddit, many of them have to do with a general feeling of dis-ease or anxiety about the future, um, where many people say, basically, why even work? Why should I slave away for this company? When they don't care about me, they don't pay me enough, I can't own a home, my future is hopeless. How should I live my life? I'm just going to try to party and have a good time because the world's just getting worse. You think about climate change, and there's a lot of trepidation about climate change. And so there, like I told you guys before about the group of people who are, um, I forgot what it's called, but it's basically like anti-child or anti-children. Uh, it's a subreddit that says... It is more, and and again, these people can be on a spectrum from like extremely aggressive, where you are morally bad if you have children, to just simply like, it is my own personal choice. I don't think I want to have kids because I don't want them to enter into a horrible world that's getting worse. But there are some people who say, because of climate change, because of the economic state of the United States, because of war, because of all of these things, poverty, um, this world is not worth living in. And I don't want to have a kid, and I don't want to bring them into the suffering and evil. Okay? All of these questions are expressing this deep question in our hearts, which is, why are there weeds? Why did you do this, God? What does Jesus say? 
does Jesus defend himself with a kind of logical argument? He very easily could have. He could have said, there's actually some holes in the problem of evil where, and, and I would say one of the biggest holes is when you're saying, so the formal formulation of the, the problem of evil often says, okay, God's all loving, all powerful, all knowing. Um, if he is all of these things, he would not allow unnecessary evil and suffering to exist. The next premise, there is unnecessary evil and suffering in the world. Therefore, God is not all loving or all powerful or all knowing, or else he would have stopped that and restrained it, right? The problem is, um, who are you to decide what's necessary to God, okay? Is it possible that God had a reason it was necessary to allow this evil to exist that you as a finite, limited human can't understand? That's one of the weaknesses of the problem of evil, the logical weaknesses. The emotional problem is still very compelling. Um, and there's been a lot of philosophy uh, from Christians, non-Christians done on this problem in the, in the 50s and 60s and different things like that. Um, but how does Jesus answer in the parable? He says, why are there weeds? An enemy did it. And so if you're asking the problem of evil and you don't concede the existence of an enemy, you're not understanding the Christian worldview, okay? Because we live in a war zone. Jesus explains in the parable, the enemy is the devil. And basically, the world we live in right now, the devil is sabotaging the good work of God in the world. The devil is sowing evil and sin and temptation and causing wickedness all over the world. And he's extremely intelligent and extremely smart and powerful and able to do that in a way that is absolutely devastating to us as humans. If you don't understand this, you don't understand the Christian worldview. And so when you ask the problem of evil, it's not as simple as to say, oh, if God was blah, blah, blah. Now, when you introduce the devil to the equation, then someone could simply ask, okay, then why did God allow the devil to exist? Or why did God create the devil, right? And so you keep on going back, and that's a very like respectable philosophical question or response to this. But all I'm saying is you have to at least acknowledge that this is a war zone and this is a dangerous area where the devil is real and the devil is the one who is causing. Um, how do you reconcile this with the goodness of God, the love of God, the power of God? And this is where it gets very mysterious and I can't really give a great answer. But all I can say is um, God promises that in the end he will completely undermined, undermine and subvert every single effort of the devil to cause evil in the world. Now, like he will subvert and undermine every single instance where the devil causes sin and suffering and trauma and death. And now like the claim, that's a, that's a very bold claim that I'm making. And the only way I can back that up is with scripture. But then the other way I can back it up is with the life of Jesus where when Jesus went to the cross, the devil thought that he was winning, right? The devil was killing God and man who came to this world to set people free and save them, and he was dying on a Roman cross, and the devil was thinking to himself, ha, 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 I'm winning, my plan is working, this is awesome. But what was happening? What was actually going on there? God in the same act of using evil choices and the evil temptation of the devil, the, the devil's evil plan, he was completely undermining the purposes of the devil. The devil wanted to kill the son of God. The devil wanted to remove the possibility of this son of God being king and saving the world and bringing restoration and re reconciliation to the world. And the devil thought he was winning. But in that very moment where the most evil was happening, the most good was also happening. God was working that evil devil plan to produce the most good that the world had ever seen through Jesus' death and resurrection. So what the truth of this parable is, every time the enemy is trying to do evil in your life and evil in the world, God promises that somehow, if not now, then in eternity, he will make it right with you. He will make it right. The pain and suffering you're experiencing, he will bring resurrection and redemption out of that. And you will never be able to see, say to God at the end of your life, God, you weren't fair. 
you didn't keep your promises, I cannot see any reason for the suffering in my life, you're not good. You will never be able to see, say that because God promises to bring resurrection and comfort out of every single horrible thing that's happened in this world. And when I'm saying that, I'm not being like naive. Like when, when I'm saying this, I'm thinking about like very specific tragedies that have happened in our church. And I feel it. I still feel it. But what I can trust, the only thing I can trust is the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which says God in the end, at the end of the age, when he judges the evil and the good, he will wipe every tear from our eyes and we will just say, God, you are good. You had a plan all along that we couldn't understand. The reality of the devil means the world is a war zone. And this, do you see how, do you see how this starts to address your, your issues with God, your, your problems with God. It's not God's fault. And the way that God works is he actually allows the devil to have a leash, just enough leash that the devil can do evil, which God can use to produce good. It's really mysterious. The more you read scripture with this lens, the more you'll see this pattern happening where what man intended for evil, God intended for good. It's all over the place. But at the same time, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The prince of the power of the air is at work in the sons of disobedience. There are wheat, there are weeds, the world is a war zone, okay? Let's keep going. The final judgment is both hope and despair. Let me read from the explanation of the parable. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here we have one of the many instances where Jesus talks about the doctrine of hell. And when people say, how could, if, if I were to say, what's your impression of Jesus? Many people would say, Jesus was a great guy. You know, he was super duper nice really loving. But my question is, why is Jesus the one that talks about hell more than basically anyone else in the Bible? If you actually read what Jesus says, he constantly is talking about hell. He's constantly talking about a separation at the end of the age where all causes of sin and lawbreakers will be sent outside of the city and thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there's this picture of exclusion, separation, destruction, pain. This is the doctrine of hell. But what I want, to, want you to, say, to see is your understanding of the doctrine of hell is actually very deficient and, okay, mine too, like informed by pop culture, not basically informed by the biblical witness, what Jesus actually says about hell. Um, your picture of hell looks something like... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of Futurama, but there's this robot devil. Anyway, um, when, when I think, Lenzer knows. Um, when I'm thinking about hell, what you think about hell is, hell is a place where a, a goat with like a pitchfork and horns is like poking and prodding all those like bad people, right? But that's actually not what's going on here. That's not, that's not what's going on here. In the final judgment, it says that God will remove all causes of sin and lawbreakers from the kingdom, from his kingdom. So the picture here is not God takes pleasure in sending people to hell. The picture here is God would not be a good God if he didn't protect the innocent from evildoers. If you, if you want to think more, this is a really profound thought, I, I think. I, I, didn't make a, I didn't make it up. It's in the parable. Um, but there's a really good book called The Skeletons in God's Closet, by Joshua Ryan Butler. It's a, he's a pastor in Portland where he talks about hell and judgment and holy war and all kinds of stuff. So it's an apologetic book and apologetic means he's trying to answer profound questions about God uh, in a way that makes sense of the bib biblical worldview, okay? And he has this quote where he says, God's compassion for the oppressed fuels his judgment of the oppressor. You guys getting me? So the way I would think about it is this. 
If God is loving and he sees one of his children being hurt by a criminal, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to smite them. He's going to stop them. He's going to do something to protect that person from evil. And so the picture here, the picture of hell is out of his compassion for the righteous and the innocent, he removes the lawbreakers. He removes the people who are causing a ripple effect of trauma and pain and devastation. And so he's basically saying, if you're good, if you're righteous, you can stay in my kingdom. If you live out the values of Jesus, if you are a good person, whatever that means, you can stay in the kingdom. But if you're a lawbreaker and if you cause sin, you're going to be excluded. And the reason he does that is if you look at the, um, if you look at, there's this really interesting little word. Um, he says uh, in verse 43, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Do you see the logical relationship between these two things? God is purifying his kingdom so only good people remain so that there can be thriving and peace and justice in his city. But in order for that to happen, he has to remove the evil and the destruction and the sin. Do you, this just makes sense, right? If you were to put, like, if, if you were to, uh, so, okay, sorry, this is really mean, but I just thought of it. Um, you know Australia was a prison colony? So, like, the, England took all their criminals and sent them to a faraway island to remove them and try to purify their city so that they would stop causing harm. It didn't work. Why? Because there are not good people and bad people. The evil is within me. The, the evil is within us. And so the question here, this is why the final judgment is both hope and despair. We need hope. We need the hope of God's judgment to remove evil from the world. We can't do it ourselves. It's intractable. This is why all of history is characterized by sin and death, death and devastation. We need God's final judgment. But if God is to judge, who can be spared? Can I say, can you say that you have never been a cause of sin in someone else's life? Can you say that you have never broken the law of God? I cannot say that. And I mean, I can think of like many times, like I, I have... <laughs> I was a super jerk when I was in middle school and high school. I would bully people, even my friends. I was really mean. I would say nasty things to people. I stole my friend's Pokemon card in third grade and I got away with it. I'm, I'm serious. I'm like, I am a lawbreaker and I am someone who causes other people to sin. I don't just get hurt by people, I hurt people. And so it's hope and despair. Who can be saved? How can we be rescued from the situation? We need God's judgment, but how can God re rehabilitate us and restore us without also destroying us, okay? Um, let's keep on going. The paradox of judgment is we want God to judge. We really do. In the problem of evil, the question, the question is saying, God, why can't you punish evil? Why can't you remove it? So we want God to judge. But in the question, the people asking the question are not pointing that lens at themselves, where they're not saying, you're, what, they're, what they're saying is, I'm good. God is the one doing all the bad stuff, and I've never done anything wrong, which if they have any sense of self-awareness, I don't think they would be able to say that. Now, it still is a, a problem because it still says something about God, but I would just say, like, you're a part of the problem. Um, there's the oft-quoted uh, Solonitsyn quote where he says, like, the line between good and evil runs through the center of the human heart, right? Where I am both good and evil. I cause sin, I am sinned against, I'm good, I'm evil. I don't do the good I want to do. I do the evil things I don't want to do. We want God to judge, but we want God to have mercy. We want judgment for others, but grace for ourselves. And so this question that's so profound, along with the two profound questions we asked earlier, how can God restrain us from doing evil in our hearts? Uh, sorry, how can God restrain us from doing the evil in our hearts without destroying us all? And this is where we get to the patience of the farmer. What does the farmer say to the servants? Do you want, they, they ask him, okay, there are weeds and there are wheat. Do you want us to go and gather them up? 
But he says, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let, it, let them both grow together in the harvest. What is God saying here? God promises to restrain evil through two means, rehabilitation and only if that fails, removal. And this is the patience of God. This is a beautiful passage in 2 Peter where um, the, the author writes, God is, so the, the, the author is basically asking the question, some people say God is taking forever in bringing judgment to this world and restoring the brokenness and evil and, and ending, ending the world and making things right again. Why are you taking so long, God? Why are you taking so long? How long are evil people going to prosper? And Peter says this, the Lord is patient with you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Do you know why God doesn't destroy the evil ones right now, immediately? He doesn't just wipe the, the face of the earth from all the evil people wiped off the face of the earth because he doesn't wish that a single person would perish, but he wants every single person, every single human who he loves and created to come to their senses, repent of their evil, leave the kingdom of the devil and go back to his side. He wants us all to repent and that's why he's patient. He doesn't root up the weeds and the wheat because he wants to turn every weed into wheat. He wants all the weeds to repent and turn into wheat and repent. So what does repent mean? To repent simply means to say, God, I am a cause of sin. I hurt people. I reject you. I'm a lawbreaker. And not only that, I can't help myself. I can't stop doing that thing that I know is wrong. I do it all the time. I keep on lying about my friend. I keep on gossiping, whatever it might be. I can't help myself. God, can you help me? Jesus Christ, when he came to the world, he was so patient with us that when he was being crucified on the cross, he looked out at the crowd and the people killing him and he said, my father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's patience. Let me give you a few examples of God's patience in reality. Uh, the Apostle Paul used to be called Saul, and he persecuted and killed Christians. For, for, uh, not, not for fun, but that's what he made his life about. If you were to look at him and ask the question, Are, is he a weed or a wheat? Which one would you say? He's definitely a weed, right? But do you know what God said? Nope. I'm going to change him. I'm going to rehabilitate him. I'm going to meet him on the road to Damascus and turn a persecutor and murderer of Christians into my apostle. And so Paul could preach the gospel and say to people, I am the chief of sinners because I have killed people. And yet God is so patient that he doesn't just blot Paul off the face of the earth. He completely undermines and subverts Paul's evil by changing him into someone good someone who saves people and transforms people and delivers them from the devil. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that so incredible? That's, that's even more powerful. That's even more transformative than simply destroying someone. God could do that in a heartbeat. But because of his patience and love and compassion, he's, he, he has this paradox. He has to save the innocent. He has to punish the wicked. But he doesn't want to do, he wants to turn the wicked person into someone good and have them do good so that they can be saved because he loves them, even his enemies he loves. The Lord is patient, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What does this mean for us? Um, what's the now what? Don't write people off. Uh, you should never give up on anyone. You should never judge another person and say, this person is never going to be saved. If God could change Paul's heart, he can change any heart. God loves that person who you think, you, who you're judging, and you're like, they're never going to be a Christian. They're so stubborn, or whatever it might be. You never write people off. We can't judge people. Only God can judge. And so we leave vengeance to God because he is a perfectly just judge. Don't write people off. Instead, persevere. If we live in a war zone, don't think to yourself, 
I want to wipe this person off the face of the earth. Think instead, I want to be patient like God and pray for them and persevere in sharing the gospel to them, in loving them, in being good, in manifesting the fruit of the Spirit in my life so many people could be saved. We're ambassadors of reconciliation, where we say to people, be reconciled to God. You don't want to be in the final judgment before his throne and say, God, I don't want anything to do with you. I'd rather have it my way. I'd rather continue to do evil. You don't want that. You don't want that. So be reconciled to God. Are you a weed or a wheat? You can't know until the final judgment, but you can't ask this question, how do you respond to Jesus? What do you think about God? Do you know him? Do you love him? Have you trusted in him? Have you believed in him? Have you repented? Have you said, God, help me. I am desperately in need of your help and deliverance from my sin. I know that I'm evil. I know that I hurt people. Will you forgive me and help me and save me? Have you made that decision? Here's the thing. I'm, I'm like turning up the heat in the room, final judgment, pressure, all that stuff. There's a paradox here too, where again, I want you to actually work through your questions. And because I believe God is good and doesn't want you to perish, he will give you time to work through your honest questions with God. And yet at the same time, there is a great urgency to this decision to this choice to follow God or follow the devil, because I don't know how long any of us will live. And this might be the last chance some of you have to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And look, I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm just saying this world is finite and crazy stuff has happened. Eliza Fletcher just taking a run in the morning. Next thing you know, she was gone. Will you respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ Do you trust that he's good? Do you trust that his judgment is hope for the world? And can you understand his rationale in acting the way he does, where he withholds his judgment out of his patient desire for people to repent, but in the end, ultimately, you will be forced to stand before him and say, how can I be saved? And the only way you can be saved is to say, I am evil, I am full of sin, but your blood, Jesus Christ, can cleanse me and forgive me. And because of that, I can become your child. And so I repent of my evil works. I repent and renounce the devil, and I want to follow you, Jesus. Um, Will you close your eyes real quick? I don't normally do this, but I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. If you want to repent in this moment, um, I just want you to say a short prayer to God and say, God... Help me to understand who you are. I don't know you perfectly, but I want your help in, return, in turning away from my sin and my evil, and I want to turn to you. Will you show me who you are? Will you save me? And I thank you for Jesus Christ on the cross who died so that I could be forgiven and reconciled to you. So pray something like that. I'll give you a few seconds. Uh, If you prayed that prayer, uh, many of us would love to talk to you. Uh, If you want to talk to me, if you want to ask me some questions, I'll stick around for a little bit after service. Um, But I am so excited if you did. And I just want you to know, uh, by praying that prayer, God is going to really respond to you. um, And you have become, you've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and entered into the kingdom of his son. Uh, This is the parable of the field, the parable of the weeds and the wheat. Are you a weed? Are you a wheat? Do you know the patient love and compassion of God? Do you know how God's judgment is so necessary to end the evil in this world? Um, But his grace is so good that he would save us and send Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray God that you would take the response of our hearts um, 
and you would grow incredible fruit uh, in our lives where we would be agents of healing and comfort to people who are afflicted, that you would comfort us in our affliction and pain so that we might help and be agents of your healing and reconciliation in this world. Um, I pray against the work of the evil one, and I pray that you would be saving lives and changing us and transforming us, that um, broken and captive people like me, like us, would be healed and set free in Christ Jesus. We love you so much. We thank you for this parable, even though it's hard. And I pray, Lord, it would stick with us and we would be changed by your word. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.